We spoke to Christine Fair earlier today. She's a professor of security studies at the Georgetown University. She's an authority on South Asian affairs and counterterrorism. We began by talking about what happened on the BBC. Professor Fair was discussing the well-established links between the Taliban and Pakistan, but the BBC cut her short. I asked her whether she thought it was ignorance or a sign of open bias by the anchor. I really wish I knew. This has really been my first experience with the BBC behaving so shamelessly. Um, you know, she continually said, well, Pakistan would deny this. But the, the odd thing is, is that many of the things that I had stated, Pakistanis had previously stated on the BBC itself. Um, Pakistani officials have repeatedly uh, accepted the fact that they have, cre they didn't, they creating the Taliban is a, a little bit of a stretch, but that it has always been a Pakistani project that they have aided and abetted them. Musharraf himself was on BBC making uh, these acknowledgments. What I find really very frustrating, BBC apparently issued a, a statement saying that it's routine that news readers challenge the guests well they never challenge the pakistani officials when they are on the bbc they let them speak uninterrupted no matter how preposterous the the lies are so i have to say um i find it really difficult that to believe that ms thomas is an ignoramus right these are not jobs that one just wanders into and I've been on her show previously. I have to conclude that what she did was purposeful. Um, and I, I, what I particularly found distasteful was the eye roll expression that she made. Now, of course, I couldn't see it during the call. I could only see it after I watched the interview the next day. It was really despicable. Um, she really seemed to be caring more about Pakistan's feelings than she did Afghan's lives. Do you think this is part of a larger problem with the Western media? They seem to give Pakistan a free pass. Have you had similar experiences with other networks? I had a, a similarly obnoxious interview with Bloomberg Asia a few weeks ago. So if Ms. Philippa Thomas's red line was speaking the truth about Pakistan, the issue there was China. Um, that interview oh, it was centered around how will the Taliban govern? And I made the point, it's whether or not Western countries acknowledge the Taliban is irrelevant. It has what it needs from the four embassies that are open in Kabul, and that is, of course, China, Russia, Pakistan, and Iran. And I pointed out that the Chinese have had a long-standing working relationship with the Taliban pre-9-11. I talked about the different um, in, um, investment projects that the Chinese did for the Taliban before 9-11 and the commitments to do the same now. And the host uh, tried to shut me down. He says, well, of course, that's your opinion. I said, no, these are facts. I can send you the, the documentation that I have used to inform my opinion. And he continued to call it an opinion. And I said, sir, it's a fact. I, I'm not going to have you tell me that, that this is an opinion. These are facts. The Taliban had a deal with the Chinese pre 9-11. The Taliban have been negotiating with the Chinese. I, that you don't know this is astonishing to me, but this is a fact. What about Western governments? They rush back to partner with the Pakistan government. They don't seem to mind the betrayals and the double games. What explains their obsession with Pakistan? That is a question that I have to say really frustrates me and and. and for the last couple of years, I actually just stopped writing op-eds because it was just so tiresome and no one seemed to care. You know, I think there are a couple of reasons. Um, I, I can't speak to the British. Honestly, the British are far worse than the Americans. The British will defend the worst of the Pakistanis. I don't know uh, if you saw what the British Army chief has said a few weeks ago about Pakistan being the biggest victim here. And I wanted to scream, like, how can you say Pakistan's the biggest victim? The Afghans are the biggest victim. And Pakistan isn't a victim at all. I, you know, it, it's sort of like um, calling the rapist a victim. I mean, it is just, I, I, it is outrageous. Um, so I don't have a lot of good answers. But what I will say, 
having watched the Pakistanis in play for quite some time, they have very well-placed interlocutors at major think tanks. Um, and I, you know, I have said this repeatedly time and time again. So you have the, Stims, the Stimson organization. Now, what does it mean to have an interlocutor? I am not accusing the Pakistanis of paying them. I'm certainly not making, you know, because you don't actually have to pay them. When Michael Crapon refuses to condemn anything that Pakistan does or Samir Lawani, they're not doing it because the Pakistanis are paying them. That's ridiculous. They're doing it because they have grants for projects. And to get those grants, they had to promise access to Pakistan. And you're not going to get access to Pakistan if you don't defend their outrages. But when it comes to the level of the government, obviously, you would argue that they would know better. And the problem there is that the Pakistan problem is really hard, right? And they don't they don't want to admit publicly that we have to acquiesce to Pakistan because it has nuclear weapons and a lot of terrorists. But in, in practice, they do. I mean, you saw this um, in a Lindsey Graham tweet a couple of weeks ago where he basically said as much, you know, Pakistan's got a bunch of nuclear weapons and a lot of terrorists. So we're going to have to basically work with Pakistan. So essentially, Pakistan, um, it really does. You know, it, it's not just a joke. It's a truth. Like Pakistan really is the arsonist. Right. Then it goes out and does a GoFundMe campaign to buy up a bunch of PR reps to peddle Pakistan's reputation so that everyone thinks it is in fact the fire brigade. That's their business model. And it works. It really works. What's next for this new nexus between the Taliban, Pakistan and China? Do you see any scenario where this alliance gets derailed? The only way that this axis of weasels get broken is if China and Russia begin experiencing blowback. But I'm not even, I don't know on what scale that blowback would require, given the interests that China has economically in Afghanistan. And you, you know, of course, Pakistan has, it has suffered blowback. It's already beginning to suffer blowback. And it, as long as the people that are dying are not Punjabis, the Pakistanis don't care. As long as it's Baloch and Pashtuns that die, the Pakistanis are really not terribly moved. Um, and as long as those attacks happen in places that are not strategic. So I'm actually very pessimistic um, about what can happen. And um, the Taliban have a very large collection of U.S. weapon systems. They have trainers, right? How did the Taliban learn to fly Blackhawks? They're pretty difficult to operate aircraft. Well, clearly the Pakistanis helped them do that. So I'm, I'm really not optimistic. Um, I think the options that India had in the 1990s, those options are gone, right? The, it looks as if Panjshir has just been decimated uh, with the help of these Pakistani airstrikes. Christine Fair, thanks very much for being with us here on Beyond. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.